Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner and today my very special guest is author Peter V. Brett. How are you mate? I'm great, how are you? Yeah, I'm really well, thank you. You know, given the fact that we're in the middle of a, a, a you know, an ongoing um, you know, global pandemic and the climate's completely screwed and the political situation is a nightmare. Oh, you know, when you, when you factor all of those things in, I'm very good, I'm extremely well. I, yeah, as well as can be expected under all of those circumstances. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, yeah. I, I, and and which really means, what do you do in situations like this? You uh, you seek refuge in fantasy and novels like The Desert Prince, which we're here to talk about today. Your all new novel, which everybody watching this can order from the links attached to this conversation. So, so Peter, you're supremely well known, of course, for, for the demon cycle. But what can you tell me about the Desert Prince? Uh, my mom says it's very good. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Excellent. So, and she has no reason to lie. She like this. The Desert Prince. Uh, I, I'm trying to walk the razor's edge with it. It um, is set in the same world as the Demon Cycle, uh, but it takes place 15 years after the end of that series. So the Demon Cycle ends with a, with a firm ending. Uh, all of the major story threads are closed out. You can finish that series and stop and be safe. Um, but if you're interested in continuing the journey, 15 years later. Um, some of the uh, progeny of the heroes of the previous series uh, are growing up and discovering that their world has all sorts of problems as well. Um, so there's a whole new cast of characters. If you haven't read my books before, everything you need to, to start on the adventure and get rolling is in the Desert Prince. Um, but if you are a longtime reader, uh, you'll see a bunch of familiar characters in the background, usually as like scolding parental figures now, rather than the, the reckless adventurers themselves. Um, so I think it's, it's a good balance where longtime fans will feel like they're coming home, but new readers can jump in and feel like they have everything they need to just get going on the adventure. Um, so I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, I mean that 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 does sound fantastic. Do you have an umbrella title in place yet for the for the for the new series? The Nightfall Saga. The Nightfall the Saga. Series. Fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. this is book one of the Nightfall Saga. Um, there will be like if you read the, this without having read the other books, there will be some spoilers for the other books, but I don't think anything that would stop you from enjoying it if you decide to go back to the backlist. Yeah, which which frankly, anybody watching this, if you haven't read. Uh, Peter's backlist. That's what I would completely recommend. Also available from the links attached to this conversation. I hear they're very good. S start at the beginning and, and, and rock through. So, um, so I I'm really interested in um, your journey to like the place that you you are now as a novelist. Because um, something that you and I have in common, although I'm a journalist, not an author, mm. is that uh, I believe that one of the initial things you did was work in pharmaceutical publishing. Which, it's true. Which I also did, mate. So, uh, so I, I, I'm sorry. I, I feel <laughs> your pain. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I feel, escaped. I feel your not yet medicated pain, you know, so I, I, I get it. So how did you, how, how did that work out for you? And how did you manage to, uh, try, how did you transition and how did you create the demon cycle? So I, I, I always knew that I wanted to be a writer, or at least I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a writer. But um, when it came time to go to college, uh, I could really only afford to go to a state school. And I picked the best one that I got into, um, which was the University of Buffalo, which is a fine school if you're looking to be an engineer. Um, they did not have a creative writing program. And so I just took a bunch of English literature and art history classes and got uh, you know, a, a BA in English literature and a, a minor in art history, and then realized after I graduated that that qualified me for no jobs. <laughs> so uh, I had the, the English skills. And so I started out, I took the first editorial job I could get. Well, I started out managing a comic shop. I managed a comic shop for a year. And then after that, I got a, um, job editing phone books. You may remember phone books. Uh, I do indeed. Yeah. <laughs> some well, of the other people I'm a person of a certain not. age. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, editing phone books is exactly as fun as it sounds. Um, <laughs> so then I uh, took a job uh, from there editing medical journals. 
um, or in, like an assistant editor at a medical journal company, uh, John Wiley and Sons. And then from there, I moved to another company um, called Medical Education Network. And what they did was they hired journalists to go to medical meetings and um, report on the, the presentations there. And, but it was all sponsored by pharma. So, you know, you would have a journalist who would go and they would cover a bunch of legit things, but then the pharmaceutical company would also have this little satellite thing where they talk about the off-label uses of their drug that they're not allowed to talk about at the actual meeting. Yeah, right, yeah. And then we, you know, we would report on that. Um, and so like, I don't think, it was a very careful dance to make sure there were, there's a lot of laws regulating that and we followed them all, but it's still, wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I did get a lot of experience doing that though, because um, I went from editorial uh, to print production. And then from there I became like a production supervisor. And so I was building websites for clients. I was making promotional items. I was hiring journalists. I was hiring artists. I was doing art direction. Um, and so I built up a lot of publishing skills that transferred very well when the book that I was writing like late at night and on the train in the morning uh, finally sold. Uh, I had a whole bunch of publishing skills that I was able to bring in and uh, that helped me immensely in starting my career. I knew how to build an a website. I knew how to hire artists. I knew how to do all the things that you need to do in order to, to make a bit of a splash in the publishing industry. And so when I sold that first book and I, well, I fold, sold the first trilogy in the US, it was nice, but it wasn't change your life money or anything. Um, but then I sold it in the UK and then I sold it in Germany and then I sold it in France. And right around then I did the math and figured, okay, I'm still not making as much as I make at my day job, but I am making enough to pay my bills. So let's just try this writing thing. I gave myself two years to see how it would went, how it would go, and um, quit my job. And I said, "Look, I don't like this job. I can always get another job yeah. that I don't like. Yeah. So let's try just this once to do something that I do like." So I gave myself two years. I figured my my finances would hold out for that long, and that was twelve years ago. Uh, so. I, I still, think still that, treading water. I think that is a very structured and inspirational um, way to go about things. And I, I, in fact, I, I would say that for anybody, you know, who's interested in a writing career, I think the way that you approached it was to, to bring a, a semblance of, a, of um, financial stability to your life and then go, right, I'm not going to do these jobs that bore me to death forever. I will give myself a period of time to try and not do that. It, it's, it's such a responsible and, uh, and clever way to do it. And, um, and uh, you know, I think uh, rather than just spend, you know, I know lots of writers and journalists also, in fact, you spend years scrabbling around in the, in the wilderness on minimum wage because they're not prepared to... Uh, not prepared to compromise you know but actually i think getting your life in order and then learning the skills that are useful as a writer and jumping off from that base i think that's such a smart thing to do and i think you're kind of the object lesson for the best way to do it because if things work out spectacularly well like they have for you you know it, then it's all it's all good isn't it you know you, you must be so happy you did it that way I, I really am. I, I do believe like you have to have your house in order. And so if you can't do that, then you've got no business uh, jumping into art, you know, like both feet, both feet first. I know a lot of writers who I feel got published too early. I think that they, they jumped out and there's like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. And they sold a book that wasn't their best work because they couldn't wait. Whereas I've got four novels that I wrote that were not good enough and I'm not going to try and publish them even now when my name could get them published because they weren't good enough. I didn't sell, I didn't write a book that I thought was really good enough to sell until I was in my thirties. Um, and so by that point I had built a stable enough life that it could handle a little wobbling while I tried this, you know, tried to do art full time. Um, I really think that it's it's incredibly important to approach it that way. Um, if you just jump in and say, I'm going to make art and who knows what's going to happen, like you're creating a lot of unnecessary 
angst for yourself. I mean, some people manage to do that and that's, that's great, but you gotta, you gotta be responsible as well. I, I, I think, I think it, that's great advice to anybody. Now, let me ask you a, bit, a little bit about your process. Your, uh, your, your novels are famous for these uh, amazing environments that you created. What comes first for you when you're developing a narrative? Is it, is it the characters or is it the world building? I, I don't know that it matters because they have to grow together. You can't have one without the other. You may have like your first bit of inspiration could be some minor idea about how a magic system might work, or it could be some idea about a character, or it could be some idea about a, a world, but that alone is not enough to, to run a story. You need all of those things together. People are not gonna care about your world building or your cool magic system if they don't care about the characters. Um, and they're not gonna care about your like world building and your characters if like the magic system is, stupid and doesn't make sense or confuses the reader too much or, you know like, like all of these things have to work in tandem in order to build a story and they don't just leap fully formed out of my head I, I take a long time with each book building up a like basically just a bullet list that breaks down all the chapters and says okay this person's POV here's all the things that happen in, that need to happen in this chapter here's the order in which they need to happen in order to get to this point where there'll be a, a, like the tension will be the highest and then we'll jump to the next chapter. I lay all of that out in advance before I start writing the prose. And so by the time I start working on the actual flavor of the language and the emotions of the characters that are going through it, I already know everything that's gonna happen. So there's no surprises to me as I'm going through it and I can focus on, all right, how does everybody feel about all of these things that are happening rather than me trying to figure out how to get them out of a certain, you know, how do I get Conan out of this mess? You yeah, know, like yeah, yeah. I've already figured that out and I can yeah. move on from there. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. And and brilliantly, you've mentioned a character who opens the door to the, the last thing I want to ask you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you used to manage a comic shop. And of, of course, uh, you know, one of the things we are at Forbidden Planet um, is one of the biggest uh, uh, comic book uh retail chains in the world and our london story is the biggest comic book shop in the world right um we're, we're, we're great comic book fans all of us to a person and uh and mentioning um mentioning mentioning conan you know talking about robert yowd so you you did that great uh, red sony series for dynamite back in 2014 how did that come about and how was it for you to write a comic book in that world so I, I'm a huge comic book fan. I um, went into my brother's room uh, when I was very little and stole a comic book out of his room. He had, it was X-Men 162, I believe. Um, Wolverine was like trapped on an alien world and like all of the X-Men had eggs laid in them and they were gonna turn into monsters. <laughs> he resolved that he was gonna kill all of his friends before they could turn into monsters. And it was the coolest thing I'd ever read in my life. And so every, like I probably at that point started reading every comic book there was in the 1980s. And there were a lot of them. Um, so I've got a really strong comic book background. Um, so after college, like that job called to me, I really loved managing the comic shop. Um, and then, <clears throat> and I, I am also like a lover of Forbidden Planet. I. Uh, lived next door to the Forbidden Planet in New York City for, for many Great. years. And yeah, that was my local shop. And I've done many signings in the London store yeah, and always had an amazing time there as well. Um, I was at New York Comic Con probably 20, 2011, 2012, something like, like a long time ago. Um, and I was with Brandon Sanderson. Uh, he and I share the same literary agency. And so, ah, right. Okay. Uh, I know Brandon. Right. Okay. That, that, that's interesting. So we were at the con with our agent, Joshua, and Brandon had a meeting with Dynamite Comics. And so I was just sort of along for the ride. And I started talking to their head of production. And I was just casually saying like, oh, I read your comics. Like I saw that you bought the rights to Red Sonja. I used to read that comic when I was a kid back in the 80s when... <clears throat> Mary Wilshire was doing the art and Louise Simpson was doing the writing. And like, she wasn't in the chain mail, mail bikini back then. She had like a whole different outfit. And like, I love how you've like, uh, you know, 
hired like really first class writers and artists to, to, to relaunch the series. And like, I just went into this whole spiel about the history of the character because, uh, you know, I love comics. And by the end of that conversation, he was like, I need to talk to the boss. You need to write Red Sonja. Um, but I had book contracts and I, I didn't want to commit to changing careers or, or you know, um, I had c other commitments. And so I said, can we do a limited run where I can maybe do, if not an, like an Elseworlds thing, but something where I can just uh, screw around a little and not have it affect the, the main storyline. Um, and so they let me uh, put Red Sonja back into like, take her, take, get rid of the chainmail bikini and put her back in her 1980s outfit for a while. And I, and each issue is sort of an homage to like, uh, like there's an issue that's an homage to Frank Thorne, who was the, yeah. the, the main Elton's, innovator yeah. of Red Sonja. And then there was an issue that was an homage to, to Mary Wilshire and, and Louis Simonson. And like, so I really like, it was a very personal project for me. Um, but that said, I strolled into that project with a lot of arrogance because uh, as a writer, I'm used to having control of everything and I'm used to writing a ton. And I was like, I've read 5,000 comics or like I can, I can write a comic book, it'd be easy. And then I realized that writing comics is a completely different skill set than writing novels. And I would write these like soliloquies for the character and then the art would come back and like I'd written maybe 150 words and I'd have space for 17 words <laughs> and I would yeah. somehow have to figure out how do I boil down this long speech into yeah. 17 words that still get across whatever it is I need to get across. Um, and so it was a real partnership with the artist and I was lucky that I had gotten uh, assigned some excellent artists and when I I would design a, a page for them and sometimes I would get back what I asked for and sometimes I would get back something completely different but better than what I asked for. Uh, but it, but it, there was a lot of on the fly like okay now I have to change the whole script to make it work with this. Um, which was also a lot of fun and a great learning curve and like now that I've done it I'm really glad that I did it. But I also had to get permission to do a lot of things from the yeah. rights holders of Red Sonja and I wasn't used to that because I'm used to working in my own world where I can kill anyone or change their clothes or whatever without, a, without an argument. Um, but every time I came up with a new plot idea, we had to send it to the rights holders and they had to approve it. And, and so uh, it was a good experience. I really enjoyed it and I loved the graphic novel. And so by all means, people check it out. Uh, but I, I'm sticking with novels for a while. I'm probably gonna get back to comics after this next project for something. Oh, that'd be awesome. I mean, I guess the key is I, I, I've, we do a lot of uh, time, we do a lot of licensed comics and uh, yeah. surely the key is to, if you create your own book, you don't have to jump through any of those hoops. So that would seem well, to be the Demon obvious Cycle next Comics step. may be on the horizon. Uh, that is good news, mate. That is awesome. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because that was exactly where I was going <laughs> with this. So uh, on, on that very positive and hopeful note for the future, I'm just going to say you've been watching Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner. I am privileged to be joined by Peter B. Brett. And we've been talking about his career and about his amazing new novel, The Desert Prince, the first in a new sequence, sequence in, this, in this imaginative world is creative. And you can order that book from the links attached to our conversation. Thanks so much for on joining sale, me, mate. August 25th. Or, or yeah, on sale, right August on. 5th, 2021 get it done right here yeah right here thanks for joining me today mate it's great to chat with you thank you thanks for having me this was wonderful brilliant i'll see you soon and come and join us again when the stores are open I and will, you can fly absolutely. across the atlantic whenever that is you i know. can't wait to get to london again it has been far too long well we're looking forward to seeing you brother you take care okay. yeah thank you bye, bye you too bye if you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.